Good morning. Good morning. We will get started here. It's good to be back after my three-week hiatus. Um, we missed you. Well, thank you. Uh, I understand Eric did a wonderful job, particularly for his first time out of the box. Absolutely, um, and we were nice, like you told us. <laughs> it was it was fun because I asked him. He said, "Well, I've had something I've been thinking about," and his wife said, "Are you sure? <laughs> You've never done this before." I said, "You're a deacon. One of the qualifications of a deacon is you are apt to teach." So, you know, threw him into the lake and said, "Swim." <laughs> But no, it was, it was really... You did good. Yes, I was, I was very, very happy with that. Happy to have the time to be able to concentrate on, on preaching. And then last weekend, just Cindy and I were totally off. And it was very nice and relaxing. So um, school is going very well. The students are, are responding. We're heavy into the Christian part of Christian worldview now. We've just covered creation. And this week, I'm... Um, Next two weeks, I'll be covering the fall. And so, you know, and I've got kids that literally say they're atheists. Some say they're pantheist. Every Christian stripe that you can imagine. Uh, I've got a Mormon in each class. So, you know, it's, they're just all over the place. But we're going to be looking at the, the truth of God's word and letting them, you know, let God's word do what it does and let that and them sort it out. So I'm really, really excited about that. After... The fall, then we'll be going looking at Jesus for a couple of weeks as we begin to study the redemption, and then we'll get into you know the restoration. So, yeah, it's just going to be a it's been a fun semester already, and I, I can't wait to see where God takes it from there. But I'm glad to be back, glad to be back here. As you see, we're, we've got a brand new study that we're going to be going on for probably about seven weeks or so, um, and then I'll take a break for. For Christmas and I've got a Christmas study plan and then we'll see after the first of the year we may come back to David because there's just far more to David's life to unpack than you could do in, in a quick seven week study so with that um, my Cindy would you open us this morning please <laughs> So this week is really going to be nothing more than introduction to this entire series, kind of about who David is and whatnot. We're going to establish some of those things, and then next week we'll start really beginning to unpack his life. And we're not even going to get to Goliath, the first big David story that if you ever, you know, if you were raised in church, you always got the David and Goliath story. That won't even be till that, that's coming up in a couple of weeks from now. And that's how we're going to dig into this man's life that that the first big story that everybody knows of the boy with the rock and the giant and all that that's not even coming up for a couple of weeks david is the second most mentioned man in the bible after jesus more than moses more than abraham he's he's the second most mentioned man in in scripture um, of course moses and abraham David and Jesus, those make up the big four that are mentioned the most, but, but David ranks in at number two. We're going to try and examine the totality of this very complex person who has been given the impressive subtitle of a man after God's own heart, which I can't even imagine a subtitle to your life that would equal that kind of a statement, but yet there it is that he's called that a man after God's own heart. Of course, we're going to look at the big stories. Goliath, Bathsheba, problems with his, his children, particularly Absalom and some of those. But what we're really going to go after and examine and take a look at is David's character through all of these big stories. The big stories are fun. They're great Sunday school stories with kids. We're going to look at those. But we're going to look at David's character through all that, because it's his character that God sees and gives him that moniker of, of a man after his, his own heart. 
We're going to see how David reacts and acts to triumph, to tragedy, to betrayal, and to his own sinful actions and, and attitudes. We're also going to see David's character in how he treats other people. David is considered to have set the bar as to how a king should conduct themselves. So much so that even the European kings, when, when kingdoms were all in Europe, they all tied themselves in one way or another to King David, including the British monarchy that had relics, so-called relics, that they would do their coronations on that were allegedly tied back to King David himself. That's the importance that King David is even into the European monarchies in that they wanted to tie themselves back to who is considered to be the, the greatest king um, in a biblical sense. So with that kind of background, I got this story from a, a publication that obviously doesn't even exist anymore called The Sign of the Times. It was originally published back in March 18th of 1889. The Bible is so strict and old-fashioned, said a young man to this gray-haired friend who was advising him to study God's Word, kind of like I do in class twice a week to my kids, and that they have to read portions of the Bible along because they know they're going to be quizzed on it. <laughs> and this older man was advising the youth man that if he was studying God's Word, he would learn how to live. The young man replied, there are plenty of books written nowadays that are moral enough in their teachings and do not bind one down to the Bible. The old merchant turned to his desk and took out two rulers, one of which was slightly bent. With each of these, he ruled a line and silently handed the ruled paper to his companion. Well, said the lad, what do you mean by this? The older man said, well, one line is straight and true, is it not? When you mark your path in life, don't take a crooked ruler. <laughs> when you're trying to figure out where your path is going to be, if you take a crooked ruler and try to mark out your life, you're going to end up veering off and going in strange ways. So he just did a very simple word picture for this young man of why studying the Bible was so important. So with a little play on words, we are going to start a study of looking at the ruler known as David. You, you, see, you see the intended pun there. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I am a master of the bad pun dad joke, so much so that a couple of my grandkids who now have cell phones, that's how I regularly stay in contact with them is by sending them bad dad joke puns. <laughs> Just so that they know that, you know, their sir is still thinking about them. So let's look at some basic information about David. And that's where we're really going to be going at this all morning this morning, is just establishing kind of some who David, David is. So right off the get-go, we find out that he's from the tribe of Judah. And according to 1 Chronicles 5, 2, and... and any, any scripture that I reference, of course, for anybody new in the class that we don't actually read, they're written for you at the bottom of your handout so you can look those up later and, and verify that what I said is true. And I would encourage you to do that. Make sure that A, I put in the right reference, because <laughs> I do typo from time to time. And also that, you know, you, we need to be holding our teachers and our pastors to the truth. And the only way we can do that is to be looking up scripture and making sure that what's being taught is, is accurate. <laughs> because you all have the exact same Holy Spirit that I do and that Pastor Jerry does. And that Holy Spirit will lead you to truth. And we need to be constantly checking to make sure that what's being taught is true. So anyway, according to 1 Chronicles 5.2, Judah became strong over his brothers and a ruler came from him. Saul, the first king was from the tribe of Benjamin. You all remember who Benjamin was in the sons of, of Israel. He was the baby, but he was also the true brother to Joseph by the, by the same mom, because they had all those brothers with half-brothers. Judah's territory in 
after they had come out of the Exodus and had reconquered or were conquering now the land, included Jerusalem. Judah's territory is in the south. And of course, the southern kingdom becomes known as Judah, which David eventually makes Jerusalem his capital and God's headquarters by virtue of building the temple there. But what we're going to see as we go through this study, originally Jerusalem was not in the direct control of the Israelites, even though they surrounded the city and had the land around it. Saul makes it a run at it, and then David finishes it and makes that his, his capital. So he's from the tribe of Judah. Again, that's going to have some biblical implications that we'll, we'll see as we go through the study. He will rule in Jerusalem for about 400 years, or his line will, not he personally, but the Davidic line will rule out of Jerusalem for about roughly about 400 years until Babylon comes in and finally takes them all out and puts them in exile um, back to Babylon. His bloodline is impressive in that he's the great grandson of Boaz and Ruth. So the, the study of the book of Ruth is a study of the forebears to David. And of course that also means they are the forebears, and when you look at the line of Jesus, that Ruth and Boaz, through their great grandson David, are the in the lineage of Jesus. The book of Ruth is really a story about love and redemption. The entire story is one of a family and a person being redeemed out of a position that they could not extricate themselves from. It uses the relationship between this man named Boaz and a Moabite woman, not even a Jewish woman, a Moabite woman named Ruth and her mother-in-law Naomi to paint this picture of God's compassion for the nation of Israel. Which again is important because now as being the precursor to David and then of Jesus, we see that even though the Israelites were God's chosen people, God was still interested in all people because right in the, the bloodline lineage of Jesus is a Moabite, a non-Israelite. Now there are a number of passages in scripture that give David's lineage as a son of Jesse, the son of Obed, who was the son of Boaz and Ruth. So the ideas of redemption, this idea of redemption, runs in his family. Because there's probably a good chance that David would have known his grandfather, Obed. And Obed could very well have told his grandson stories of his parents and his parents' life story because now that was a part of the Jewish lore. So look, think of a young boy David hanging out with his grandfather Obed and Obed said, well when I was boy, my mom, Ruth, oh, you, she made the best homemade you know, biscuits or something, you know. You, the typical stories that everybody tells but David has this direct connection back to that story. So when you read the story and the book of Ruth already be thinking David because that's that direct that direct history line and the family line that all talks about redemption and how things are bought back and brought back into a right relationship. We'll see David as the frequent vehicle that God uses to show his compassion and to redeem his people. David's life and his character is going to be constantly showing how God is working to bring his people back, to save his people, and to bring them back into a, a right relationship. That story of redemption that we see in the story of Boaz and Ruth, that David now lives out on a nationwide basis. And even at his death, he becomes a symbol of God's very unique relationship with his people, with the nation of Israel, and with the redemption that was still to come because of the, the, the promise that is given to David and the covenant that's made with David that a, somebody from his line would sit on the throne of Israel forever.
He's the youngest of seven sons. Now there's an argument, um, and people will say there was eight sons. You can argue this back and forth. And if you're a if you're an eight son, because there's two different passages and some Bible scholars in trying to marry the two think that by the time the second one was written, maybe one of his older brothers had died, so now David's the youngest son. To me, it, it's six of one, half dozen of another, whether it was eight sons or seven sons. Uh, I personally went with seven. But what does that tell you if you understand Jewish culture, and then actually just the culture, not just Jewish culture, but the culture of the day? If you're the seventh son, where are you in the pecking order? At the bottom. You at the bottom, son. Particularly, it's that privileged position of the eldest son, who gets the double portion, but who also is going to be responsible for his parents when they get older. But then, you know, um, they always talk about the, the, the monarchy. You have your heir, and then you have a second son, so you have a spare. <laughs> a spare to the heir. Um, well, he's got... The heir and a spare 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 and then David. So he's way at the bottom of this whole food chain. It's not lost though on a lot of Bible scholars that the number seven is always associated in Hebraic thinking with completion, with perfection. And thus the number seven becomes the number for God. They see this association of David with holiness and with God's perfect plan for his people as being that discarded, much like we saw Jesus himself being called the cornerstone, the one that had been the stone that had been thrown out by the cutters, David being the youngest, the one that nobody's going to pay any attention to because we've got all these old, older brothers that are in line, and being the oldest son of three brothers, I understand the importance. <laughs> And, and it's funny we're all well into our 60s now and I still get calls from my brothers from time to time with questions hey Harry what do you think about and they'll call up to ask big brother questions about this stuff which is perfectly fine, fine with me because my brothers and I are still all friends which is nice <clears throat> But he's way down at, at the seventh position. He's out of the line of everything. He's out of the limelight. He's out of the, you don't even think about this guy. He's from a village called Bethlehem. That's a modern day picture at night. Actually, it shows up a lot better. Let's see if I can show it to you. It's kind of a pretty little place. A small village not too far down the hill from Jerusalem, mainly known for its, its agriculture, but particularly for uh, the livestock raising that was used for the, the temple <coughs> services. So Bethlehem is not just the birthplace of Jesus. For the Israelites, this is the place where their most important king had his humble start. And for Jews to this day, Bethlehem also holds the important, not for Christians, of course, we all look at it, oh, it's the birthplace of Jesus and, and the manger and all that other, the Christmas story that we're going to be coming up to here in, in a mere, what, um, 65 days or something. <laughs> um, but for Jews, this is the home place of the greatest king that they've ever had and the king that they're always looking for to have again. So this little village holds great importance for them and he's from Bethlehem. He puts, David's birth puts Bethlehem on the map. David was called the anointed one. This is something I'm going to be covering in, in my, my class here in, in a couple of weeks at with my college kids as well when I start talking about Jesus. In the Bible, the terms anointed one and Messiah are synonymous. 
They are considered to be essentially the exact same thing. So when you read Messiah, think anointed one. Anytime you see anointed one, think Messiah. They're synonyms. God's anointed one was the person he chose to lead and save his people. So David has this subtitle to him for the rest of his life as being the anointed one, as does Jesus. Jesus is called the anointed one or the Messiah or in Greek, Christ. All of those terms mean the exact same thing. <clears throat> when the Israelites asked for a human king, God pointed out Saul to the prophet Samuel who anointed him as ruler, but years later when Saul disobeyed God, God rejected him as king. 1 Samuel 15, 26. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the, the word of the Lord, and the Lord had rejected thee from being king over Israel. Wow. The Lord, the Lord has rejected you as being king. It's not like, you know, uh, remember the old... Uh, uh, the Apprentice TV show, if you ever watched that with, with Donald Trump before he was President Trump. And his favorite, the line there that got you off the show was, anybody know? You're fired. You're, fired. <laughs> You're out. It's essentially what God is saying here. You are fired. And it's there, it's at this time, after he's rejected, after he's disobeyed and God has rejected him, that God sent Samuel to see the sons of Jesse to anoint one of them as king. It's also there that God tells how he looks at people. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For, he, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And this is, this is a common thing that's taught in churches that God sees the heart, but it comes out of the story of David. Mm -hmm. And it comes out of the rejection of Saul. But also notice in his description, he said, don't look on his stature. When God picked Saul, and I'm kind of jumping ahead to some stuff we're going to look at next week, what, does, what makes Saul stand out to everybody? He's, he's a, literally a head, bet, head higher than everybody else. And handsome. Yeah, and good looking. And God says, don't look at how tall this guy is. I don't look at that. I look at the heart. So every time you get that concept and, and you hear a preacher talking about it, I want you to think about David and the rejection of Saul because that's where that story comes out. We always have to tie biblical concepts back into the stories and the context that they come out of. Because it makes the concept that much bigger and broader when we understand not just the concept, but the entire story that it's linked to. Now, the anointing didn't instantly make David king. But it did show that he was God's chosen person to come. That's another thing that we can look at in our lives, in the lives of others around us. God can choose you for something and doesn't mean that you're going to be that position right now. It may be years later. It may be decades later. But God says, this is what I have for you. Here's what did happen immediately for David. Samuel 16, 13. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Key in on the phrase, from that day on. David is a boy, and the Spirit of the Lord comes on him in a powerful way from that time forward. And we're talking a young kid here. Now, prior to the Holy Spirit being given after the death and resurrection of Jesus, where now the Holy Spirit in, lives in you and is a part of a Christian's life all the time, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and go. And, they, and generally, he would come in and empower somebody to do something for a given time or a given event and then leave again. But here it says, from that time forward, the rest of David's life, 
is a indwelling, and it says a powerful indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I want you to keep that concept in mind as we look at all of the rest of the stories, and even him talking about, you know, him as a shepherd, you know, killing bears and lions. How did that all come about? Well, from the time that Samuel anoints him, the Holy Spirit is now powerfully working in this kid's life for the rest of his life. The interesting thing, of course, to realize there is just the fact because you have the Holy Spirit, does that keep you from making bad decisions? Does it keep you from sinning? Now, we're going to see that in David's life as well. But we're also going to see the totality. And remember, what's the moniker that is hung on him? A man after God's own heart. So the totality is going to be that the Holy Spirit is going to be because God sees something that man doesn't see in this boy. He was a shepherd. Well, that goes along with his position as being a seventh son. This is the bottom job. This is the worst. You've ever dealt with sheep? Smelly, nasty, stupid problem. If they can figure out some way to hurt themselves, they'll take it every time. Later in the story of Jesus, we, we, and we learn culturally, shepherds were, you know, they were unclean because of dealing with animals and, and all of that stuff. So he has the worst job in the household. You go take care of the sheep. Nobody else wants to deal with that. He didn't just feed the sheep, though. He led and protected them as well. And again, we're going to see that in a few weeks when he's talking to Saul and Hey, I, I took care of my father's sheep. I, you know, I killed lions and, and bears. And I, I didn't just go out there and say, okay, come on, idiots. Let's go eat. Okay, you're done now. Let's go drink. No, don't go into the deep end of the pool. Go to the shallow end. Come on, we're, we're, just, we're going to drink. We're going to leave. So he takes care of them. He learns how to take care of a group of individuals that left, if left to their own devices, are going to make really bad decisions and screw up their lives. I got to be <laughs> Which is an excellent thing to learn if you're going to rule an entire country. Something that the rulers of our country could learn. And I'm not talking about the present president or governor, but all of them. To learn how to take care of people for their benefit instead of for some political gain. During this time, of course, as I mentioned a couple times already, he had to kill both bears and lions to protect them. I, he had to put his life on the line to protect things that would otherwise get killed. So being a shepherd is a, is a big deal. While it's the low of the low, job-wise and honor-wise in society, it taught him a great deal of how to run a kingdom. He was also a musician. This guy's got a resume that just goes on and on and on. You know, if he was doing a resume builder, this guy would just have this incredible resume. When the Spirit came on David, it left Saul... And what the Bible describes as an evil spirit began to bother him a great deal. 1 Samuel 16, 14. The next verse that, of what we just read a moment ago. So when the spirit comes on David, it leaves Saul. Earlier when at Saul's anointing, it says the spirit of the Lord came on him. And Saul wins a number of battles. And he's doing good until he starts disobeying. Saul became subject to fits of intense mental agony under which his reason gave way. We see bouts of temporary insanity accompanied by outbreaks of violence. Saul's servants thought that perhaps some nice heart music would soothe him during these episodes. And so David was brought into play. Having a harpist in my own household and family I understand this. 
when Addie was still living at home and she'd be practicing her harp and playing through these various tunes, I, and I was studying either for Sunday school class or, or when I was still getting my master's of teaching, a lot of times I would go and sit in the room with her while she played. Generally, I, I like to, I'm one of those people that has to operate in quiet when I'm studying and writing and working, with the exception of harp music. And Addie could be sitting there playing on that harp and I'm just, I'd be in the zone, this is great. No, 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 keep practicing. I know it's only been a half an hour, but I think you need to practice a little more. <laughs> and apparently this idea worked we see that in 1 Samuel 16, 23. And Saul enjoyed it so much that David was brought in as a regular part of his household and was also made his armor bearer. Basically, the job of an armor bearer is to make sure that the armor is clean, it's serviceable, carry it from place to place, that sort of thing. He's not a shield bearer, he's not involved in battles, but he's the guy that gets the armor to the battle for the king, carries it there because it's heavy, makes sure it's clean, it's operational, all that. So David, as a youth, is given this additional, Saul likes him so much, they said, hey, I'm gonna give you this added responsibility, and I want you to be my not only my musician, that helps me calm down when I'm getting all freaked, but I want you to, to be my armor bearer. Yes. Are you gonna when you talk about the David and Goliath, are you gonna that's the one this story always has one whole thing. I thought, how does that happen? He's the armor bearer, but he's not already at the battle with Goliath. Yeah, we're we're okay. we're we're gonna we're gonna get there. Today literally is just, we're just painting the picture of who David was. We're not even going to really get into his life and his character and all that until next week. Okay. There's so much to unpack just of establishing who this guy is, which I said we're not going to get to Goliath for a couple of weeks. But then, yeah, we're going to be looking, looking at all of that, why he's there and why he wasn't there and all that stuff. So not only was he a musician, oh yeah, and what we're going to see also is that he ends up splitting time taking care of his dad's sheep, which is going to answer to that to some degree. So he's not living at the cats at the uh, at Saul's headquarters 24/7. He's there for periods of time. For periods of time, he goes back and de deals with his dad's sheep, and then back and forth. So he still, even though he's the armor bearer and the harpist to the king, he's still his dad's sheep herder, <laughs> which is gonna keep him a little humble because being the king's top musician and his armor bearer, you could see where that could puff your head up a bit, particularly as a, as a youth. So not as only he a musician and he's from Bethlehem and he's the anointed one, he's Seven son, he's a giant slayer. Now this story is so well known that it's been become a cliche outside of the church for any underdog overcoming seemingly impossible odds. The news will still say it's a David and Goliath sort of thing, referring to this story, even though they may not know a single thing about the Bible, they know that the a David and Goliath situation is a story of an underdog overcoming great odds. In the Bible, though, it's not necessarily really a story of an underdog overcoming great odds. It's a story of faith. It's the, when we get to Goliath here in a couple of weeks, this is a faith story. This is a trust story. This is a, I have so much faith that I'm going up against something that looks impossible, but really, it's not only not impossible, it's a paper tiger. And I'm going to go right through that piece of paper. And of course, this is going to become one of David's defining characteristics that we're going to see in, in the study of David's life is a study of his faith, where his faith takes him through things and gets him through situations and brings him out on the other side thus getting that moniker of man after God's own heart. So if you want to put down one of his prime characteristics right off on day one of this study, it's faith. And that's where he, as a giant slayer, really begins to, to we begin to see that.
kind of following up on the heels of him being a, a giant slayer is he's also a great warrior. Generally speaking, musician and warrior are not on the same resume. Generally speaking. Unless you're a bagpiper. Unless you're a piper. <laughs> Who marched in front of the army. Yeah. But David has that on his list as well. So after the, the defeat of Goliath, Saul gives David more and more responsibility in the military. And this pleased both the officers and the run-of-the-mill soldiers. You see that in 1 Samuel 18.5. That when Saul gives David all this added responsibility, the, the officers and the men are going, yes! <coughs> and when you're when you're going into a dangerous situation, when you're going into battle somewhere, you want to know that you have a leader out there who's making decisions that's there on the ground with you that you can absolutely trust. Um, all my years in, in police work, there were times that I had bosses that I went, oh no, when they showed up on scene. And there was other times I went, oh thank goodness. Sergeant so-and-so is here. Lieutenant so-and-so is here. And that's one of the things I always strove to be was one of those people that when, when I was a sergeant, when my men called me and I showed up on scene, that I could, and without trying to pat myself on the back, I could see my guys kind of physically relax a little bit. Okay, Sergeant, Sarge is here. It's going to be okay. Because Sarge has been around for a while. He knows what to do. There aren't any stories of Sergeant Sexton making stupid decisions and getting people hurt or killed. So the, his men felt about him that way. Hey, David's been put in charge. We now know we've got a leader that's going to make the kind of decisions that means most of us are probably A, going to live, and B, we're going to win. The problem, though, was that the people started to see David as greater than Saul. And we'll see that nice little ditty that they were singing of Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. Which, uh, of course, makes a self-centered person like Saul lose his lunch. <laughs> so what does Saul do? He takes his greatest military asset that he has and drives him off. And ends up becoming David's enemy and tries to hunt him down. The old cut off your nose to spite your face. I, here's the greatest military mind I have in my army, but people like him better than me, so I'm going to get rid of the greatest asset I have, and I'm going to try to hunt him down and kill him. But that tells you how great of a warrior David was. Now, so far, everything we've looked at on David's life has been pretty darn positive. He's also considered to be Israel's greatest king. Initially, we're going to see that David was just king over the tribe of Judah. 2 Samuel 2.4 then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. They told David it was the men of Jabesh-Gilead who buried Saul. So Saul's dead, and just the tribe of Judah anoints him king. For a short time, Saul's son Ish-bosheth, say that one three times fast, Ish-bosheth, was made king of Israel by Saul's top general, Abner, until both Ishbosheth and Abner were murdered. So the next time you're playing Bible trivia and they say, What number was David in the king line of Israel? He was number three. Typically, say he was sick, where Saul and there was David. Because for a very short period of time, a few weeks, maybe a few months, Ishbosheth was king over Israel. David was just king over Judah. David becomes king at about 30 years old. You're going to see a number. Remember, David is called what? The anointed one. Which is synonymous with? Messiah. 
Jesus starts his public ministry at about 30 years old. You're going to see a lot of correlations between David and Jesus, particularly on the positive side of David's life. <laughs> Obviously not on his, his screw-ups and negative things. As king, he wins battle after battle and finally extends Israel's borders and control to what God had originally promised and beyond. So it has been years and years since they have crossed into the land of Israel. And God told them, I will go before you. You are to take out this people, this people, this people. And of course, what did the Israelites do? They went in, took over a few, and then said, nah, we don't want to play anymore. And it's not until, and then we have all the, remember we studied the book of Judges. We have all these different people still coming in, and the various judges coming in, and as God would raise them up for a time, indwell them, the Holy Spirit would indwell them, they would take care of that, and then the people would return to their stupidity, and another group would come in. It's not until finally the time of David that the borders are taken to what God had promised. So we are talking years and years and years and years after they have entered the land. Like I said, everything's been very positive, but David does some screw-ups. He commits both adultery and murder. Which, while being really, really, really bad, I think we can all agree on that. Adultery, murder, bad things. Those are kind of universal. If I go around people, whether they've ever been raised in church, they say, yeah, murder, bad. Cheating on your boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, bad. And yet, what is the moniker that God hangs on it? So seeing that his totality ends up in that positive, and seeing these, we see that redemption can cover even the worst of crimes. <clears throat> Though he, um, though Bathsheba may have been technically divorced, and I'll explain that more when we get to the story of Bathsheba, um, David wasn't. <laughs> David was married and actually married a couple of times by the time he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And as typically happens, one sin often leads to another. In, in trying to cover up or deal with the results of a previous sin. So her husband Uriah, come, you know, he calls for Uriah to come home because the adultery leads to a pregnancy. But Uriah actually has honor, unlike David at the time. And he won't enjoy time home with his wife while his men are out on the battlefield in tents getting ready to go to battle. So David's plan, and I said, we'll discover discuss that more later when we get to that story of uh, saying, okay, look, you came home and slipped your wife, oh, look, she's pregnant, ta-da! Or as my father-in-law used to say, first children can come any time after that, they all take nine months. Now he, he's going to say, well, I was home there, but she, well, maybe it was born early. He's not counting on the math, he's just counting on, okay, you were home, so now I can lay it off on that. But Uriah has honor. Finally, David sends Uriah back and has him carry the sealed letter giving the instructions on how to have him killed on the battle. His honor is such that he doesn't, you know, pop the wax seal to see what, what's the king writing, you know, so I can get ahead knowledge and all. I kind of reseal it. This man of honor maintains his honor carries the letter back, and then the other commanders follow David's instruction and intentionally have David or Uriah killed on the battlefield. So he's part and part with murder. The problem with that, and we'll see it more, we'll discuss it more when we get to that story, is that to carry out David's orders, other soldiers had to die. Because they put Uriah at this particular part and then fall back. Well, they don't fall back and leave him all by himself. 
they leave him with a contingent of other soldiers, but not enough to take on the onslaught. So David's murder of Uriah ends up killing other soldiers who had no part of this, no concept of what's going on, nothing. It takes the murder of Uriah and really expands it into a big problem. Other people die as a result of David's sin. Later, Nathan the prophet confronts David and he repents and confesses before God. And then he writes Psalm 51 about restoration. It's not in your homework for this week, but that's a good psalm. And when we get to that, it will be part of the homework <laughs> when we get that story of then going and reading Psalm 51 after the death, after Nathan confronting David repents, truly repents, and repents to God, because that's who he sins against, and then he writes Psalm 51. So the next time you're reading Psalm 51, I want you to put it back into that story of, of Uriah and Bathsheba and the murder and all of that. Well, let's go back to something a little more positive, which right from the get go is David was a man after God's own heart I didn't have that red I forgot to change the color on that David's the only person in the Bible referred to in this way that makes it amazing right think about all of the heroes of the Bible Moses Abraham Paul Peter, Noah. It kind of makes sense, though. I'm just now thinking because a warrior, you know, those people who are always advised such a God of love, why does you know, he do this or that? So I mean, kind of makes sense. Yeah. All of it is it his totality, all of those <laughs> things that we've looked at. But David's the only guy in there, second most talked about guy in the Bible, that gets this moniker on it. Of the great heroes of the faith in the Bible. Only David gets this. Even beyond Paul. Even beyond Paul? And Paul probably wrote more about his personal sin struggle than any of the rest of the patriarchs. Mm -hmm. Probably pleaded for understanding more than, and recognized and pleaded more than anyone else for understanding. Yes, absolutely. And yet, only David only David is referred to in this way. This tells us something about God, which we can see in Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. So what was the biggest difference between Saul and David? Obedience. <clears throat> Obedience. Everybody, did. every counseling I've ever done, when people said, if God would just tell me what to do. <laughs> okay, here we go. And here's what he's looking for. He's looking for obedience. Faith-based obedience. I'm going to obey just because you're God and you said so. Not for any other reason. Not for what I can get out of it. Not because the circumstances warranted. Nothing. The difference between... Saul and David is obedience. When Saul becomes disobedient actually several times, that's when God says, okay, you're out. This is the same thing we see in the life of Jesus. Remember, we're going to see a lot of correlations between David, known as the anointed one, known as the Messiah, known as the person who's saving his people, and Jesus. Jesus' life is all about obedience. Not my will, but yours. You know, if you want to take this cup from me, that would be great, but that's not what's important. What's important is that I do, I'm here to do my Father's work. So David is this pre-look at what the coming anointed one is going to do completely. Another aspect of David, and this is one of his problems again, not so much for him, but it sets up a pattern that's going to be a problem for others. He had at least eight wives. I don't understand this. 
<laughs> I'm so blessed with one, I don't think I could be blessed with two. Wow. Did I say that right, Seth? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <save. laughs> that would be just too much blessing in my life. <laughs> <laughs> he has at least eight, not to mention some concubines. Here's the whole list. Ahinoam of Jezreel, Abigail, the widow of Nabal, we'll see that when we study his life, that Nabal and, and his wife Abigail helped David. Uh, Makah, the daughter of the king of Geshur, so a non-Israelite. Haggath, Abathal, Igla, Michal, the daughter of Saul, and then of course Bathsheba. So those are the eight named wives that we know. Of course, this is in direct violation of how God said Israelite kings were to conduct themselves back when Moses was giving the law. Deuteronomy 17:17. 17, 17. When Moses is writing the law, he's already anticipating that at some point the Israelites would have a king. And he's telling them, here's how to do it. So years before the judges, years before they even walk into the land, God's already giving them the plan of what to do. And here's what he says for kings, verse 17. He must not, he must not, not, it's a good idea if he does it, It'd probably be better if he didn't. He must not. Is there any doubt in your minds on what God is about to say from here? <laughs> this is a do not do. This is a no no. He must not acquire many wives for himself so that his heart won't go astray. So I wonder what the translation is. Do you think many? So what is many? Maybe many is nine. You know what I'm <laughs> Ten or greater. In, in the Hebrew, it's basically a, a better term might be uh, multiple. So it's not a number. He must not acquire multiple wives. So there's not a number attached. Basically, it's coming down to stick with a wife, keep your focus there because you're going to get multiples and now they're going to be pulling you in different directions. It's just interesting it doesn't say man of one wife like yeah. in the New Testament. Why did he commit adultery? And, no, but yeah. over and over in the Bible, Moses had more than one wife too. I never right? Joseph had more than one wife. If it was wrong in Leviticus, why did they all keep doing it? Hold on. It's a cultural thing. If you study cultures in the world, that's the hardest thing that when Christians go to other countries, with various cultures. Yeah. You're right, Anne. And, and there is a cultural aspect to it here, but there's also a, well, I can do this and it'll be okay. I, mean, uh, I, I would assume the daughter of the king of Jashur was more of a political It was a political move. She's an outsider. Right. Brought in, so it's like, I'll take care of your daughter, you take care of me. And then we'll, we won't fight each other and Yes. Yeah, and all that it all goes back to the cultural thing. But essentially, but for the rulers, he said, "Don't do this," and yet they did it anyway. We do the same thing. It may not be marrying multiple people, but there's other things. That I understand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, whatever whatever they want to say about it, it was wrong and it was sin. Yes. Whatever their reasoning was, whatever the rationale was, whatever their belief at the time, or their neighbors. 
sin. It was still, yeah, and, and Moses had written, don't do this in as complete language as you can. It, it couldn't could be go. any more clear. It, no. it, it also says, thou sh you know, don't lie. It's like, are there Christian politicians? Yes. Do they lie? <laughs> yes. Should they do it? No. no. Yeah. yeah, and people make excuse for their... What, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's okay in this, you know, it gets down to situation ethics. It's a bunch of yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another and that just that proved there's no new sin under the sun. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. Quickly, Ann. Um, I wanted to go back in my favorite of the law, you know, with the adultery and murder. And we noticed this, and you probably saw this in your own field of work. Adultery and murder, especially by people with power, with money, just like David, often get away with these two law-breaking, um, murder and adultery, right? Adultery now sometimes ends up in divorce, but a lot of times adultery is going on while people are married and they just keep face. The woman just knows about it and still stays married with the man. With murder, I mean, if you have a lot of money, you can hire someone and uh, get them off and get a murder done and never get caught. So I was just... With David, I was just like, I was just seeing the Which is essentially what David power. does. He has somebody else do his dirty work, do, do his dirty work for him. So he's got eight wives, so you know that his, he has, his mind is divided. You can't possibly not. Also, his mind's divided about the well-being of the people, because it's laying a burden on the people with taxes to support this enormous household. Yes. Right. And it also sets up disaster for because now he's setting the precedent for his own family. And he's a terrible father. He is a horrible father. <laughs> and Solomon, Solomon will eventually follow in his father's footsteps. And the predicted outcome that Moses wrote that we just read in Deuteronomy, while it doesn't show up in David's life, it shows up in Solomon's life. And his heart is pulled away from true faith. We don't see that in David's life as far as his faith in God. Solomon eventually gets pulled away into idolatry. I was just going to say, to the comment over there, David doesn't get away with more murder and adultery. No. No. Nathan, Nathan brings it right to his face and says, You are that man. And his kingdom solves. <laughs> and then you can also say that goes three or four generations deep that way. Yes, because he, he, he showed his son that, hey, it's okay. I had multiple wives, and I still stayed true to my faith. You certainly can do it, too. No. The last thing that I have on my list is that David wrote about, about half of the book of Psalms. What do we know about the book of Psalms? It's one of the two books that Jesus quotes from the most. Jesus recognizes the writing in the book of Psalms as God's word. Not only was he a talented musician, but he used his God-given creativity. The Holy Spirit came on him powerfully as a boy to write songs that have now lasted for thousands of years. When I was in Romania, and I, I had the privilege of preaching, I was able to preach on Psalm 121, one of the songs of ascent. If you watch the burial of the queen a week or two ago, you heard Psalm 121 sang musically at her funeral. Where do I look to? I look to the hills where my Lord is. So these writings of David, you think about musicians today. I play music before my classes start, and I'm, I'm all over the place personally, musically. So I, I, I've played uh, hits from the 70s, I've played bluegrass, I've played, you know, I'm, I'm all over the place. I, I recently played a bunch of stuff from Motown. So the kids come in and they hear different genres of music while they're coming in and getting ready before I start teaching. Um, probably in another, probably sometime this week, I will play some classical music 
fact is, I think I'm pretty sure I'm going to play um, the William Tell Overture. Uh, and a whole, I'm wearing Marvin the Martian today, and the, the Warner Brothers cartoons, a whole generation grew up hearing classical music as the background music to Warner Brothers cartoons. While they didn't know that this was something by Tchaikovsky or by Wagner or whatever, they knew that this was Elmer Fudd going after Bugs Bunny to the sound of classical, and they grew up, and then when they hear it, they go, oh, I know that music. Kill the rabbit. Yeah, kill the rabbit, yeah, the little flight of the Valkyries. Um, the William Tell Overture, part of it is this beautiful melodic thing, and you will see that in a lot of nature stuff, and you can see Bambi going through the edge of the forest and all this. And then the later part of it, an entire generation, many of you will know, and you call it the Lone Ranger theme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a number of people in this class, if I was to play that, you would say, oh, that's the theme to the Lone Ranger. Well, yes, it is, but it's also the William Tell Overture. So, but when I'm playing this music for the kids, they don't recognize it. And it's from my lifetime. David wrote music that has lasted for thousands of years and people still read and study and play at a queen's funeral. Most of the psalms are laments that give us a very intimate portrait of his very darkest moments. But he also wrote psalms of praise and thanksgiving and throughout all of them he frequently declares his trust in the Lord his faith in the Lord, despite all of the circumstances that are going on in his life, despite being hunted down by Saul, despite his children going sideways on him, despite whatever going on, that his faith remains true to the Lord. Um, a couple of the men have handouts I'm going to hand out now, which I'm going to give you a timeline. I would highly encourage that you hold on to these for the study, because this is a, a general historical, you can put it into dates on a, on, a, on a timeline of David's life. One of the things I want you to see right off the get-go was how old was David when he was anointed? Do we need more? Are we short? No, I think that should cover. Okay. David was only about 10 to 12 years old when he's hauled in from the hanging out with the sheep, when Samuel's looking at all of his brothers to anoint somebody to be the next king, he knows the sons of David. So think about a 10-year-old boy out with the smelly sheep that comes in and God says, this is the person. Pour the oil on his head and the Holy Spirit indwells a 10-year-old boy powerfully from that moment on. Now, does that begin to explain killing bears and lions yes. as a shepherd. Yes. Does that begin to explain the music ability that he has to calm a man with a mental condition down? All of a sudden, all of this begins to take, all of these stories of David that you've heard all your life begin to take picture, but also, I, I saw a movie, I'm watching movie clips of David's life, and typically when, movie, when somebody does a movie of this, and they show David being anointed, they always have this about 17, 18 year old young man. He was a kid. <laughs> he was a kid. We're t what's, what's 10 year old uh, grade wise? Fourth grade? Third grade? Fifth grade? Fifth grade? So, uh, what grade do you teach? Sixth, seventh, and eighth. So, a boy's younger than you is the person who's being anointed. Put that in your head. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> and smell your problem. Yes. <laughs> what we see in David is an imperfect Messiah, an imperfect anointed one. It's very fitting that David is such a prominent figure in the Old Testament. 
because as an imperfect human, anointed by God to save and rule his people, David is going to lay the foundation for Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the only sinless human, who God uses to save and rule all of humanity. So David becomes this pre-picture of what God's going to do in redemption and saving people in a small microcosm with an imperfect human anticipating that time in the lineage of David when God would now bring the perfect human to redeem us all and to rule over all humanity. So this is just the introduction to David. We've just taken a quick snapshot of who David is. And next week, we'll start with the boy David. And we'll begin to trail his life and see the characteristics that make him a man after God's own heart. Questions, comments? I hope you anticipated this is going to be a fun ride. Yes. Eric, would you close us this morning? Yes. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come together as a church family and to hear your word. And we're so grateful for the blessings and the teachings you provide to us. We just thank you for today, and we just ask that you protect us and watch all of us as we go about our day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.